The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS, the standard in the rare coin grading industry. Be sure to visit the Long Beach Expo this week, June 14th to 16th, 2018, and be sure to bring your coins for on-site grading. Visit PCGS.com to learn more. This week on the Coin Week podcast, I have a conversation with coin dealer Rob Oberth, owner of Oberth Rare Coins and Currency of Marietta, Georgia. He's the founder of the Facebook group Coin Dealers Helping Coin Dealers. I've followed the group since its infancy. It is an online trading and communication platform that connects dealers from across the country and allows for real-time appraisal and sale of merchandise that comes through the door. It is, if you will, an opportunity for instant capitalization and sale of rare and not-so-rare coins. It's also been quite a buzz at many of the coin shows that I've attended amongst dealers and private conversations after hours. It has the potential to be a real dynamic new element for the rare coin industry and could spark a revival in brick and mortar coin shops. So how does this impact you as a collector? Well, I'll ask Rob and find out next on the Coin Week Podcast. Hi, Rob. Thanks for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Thanks for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. So a few weeks ago, Scott and I talked about uh, the 100th episode of the Coin Week podcast. And, uh, you know, we had a back and forth as to, you know, what kind of gift uh, we'd give our guests once we reached that number. Uh, we finally uh, settled on a Rolex watch. And, uh, you know, that's awesome. Um, fortunately, however, uh, you are the guest for our 99th episode. So I can't give you a watch this time. So uh, better luck next time. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll have to I'll have to be try to be the two hundred then. I'll get that uh, get get the Ferrari maybe. One of the reasons, all kidding aside, um, that I wanted to talk uh, to you is I think that what you've been working on over the course of the past year or so, the uh, Facebook group Coin Dealers Helping Coin Dealers, uh, illustrates to me uh, a couple of things. Um, one is that it shows that the dealer community has not been served as effectively as could be with what I will call last generation online trading platforms, most of which are locked behind a paywall and seem to lack uh, the immediacy of a social media trading network. Uh, and also, I wanted to ask you about what I see as your network's hidden feature of providing dealers with immediate recapitalization for over-the-counter purchases. This is done by way of the dealer network being able to make offers on merchandise as it comes through the door. Uh, which I think is vital for small independent dealers for whom, without such a network, might have to pass on larger collections or more expensive coins. This further eroding uh, the relationship between the coin shop and the local collector, something uh, we have seen take place for several decades now. Yeah, so I think that um, a couple of things. I think that, you know, the, the original idea was in the beginning when we created the group was to to connect dealers um, small scale, large scale, um, to each other. And uh, not just on a trading level, but also on an information sharing level. And do it in real time in such a way where uh, we sort of eliminate uh, a lot of the the phone calls involved and the research involved and uh, do it in real time. So I think we've done that. Uh, we started off I started off calling dealers, you know, some of the larger dealers around and, and uh, some of the grading companies and, and other trading platforms and things and things, trying to see if they would be interested in tanking it on. And uh, for the most part, uh, we had a pretty good turnout really early. We added 50 to 100 members within the first couple of weeks. And um, I started out by posting questions. I think one of my first questions was, um, about a uh, Stone Mountain silver lavalier. And you can do eBay searches. You can post it on different networks and try to get information. But the good thing about the Facebook group is that it's, it seems to be a little bit more interactive where you get pinged on your phone. If, um, you know, somebody posts something, uh, you can get feedback from multiple people, dealers, and experts at the same time. And, 
So that particular coin that I had, I didn't quite have a price in mind that I was willing to pay for it. So I wanted to get a feel for what the market was from, you know, somebody that might specialize in that. And the customer wanted X amount of dollars. I think it was a thousand dollars. And, uh, you know, when I posted it up, there were several people that were interested. And I think the offers ended up falling in the 600 range. So that was a deal that it was just kind of a trial thing up front to see if it worked. And it did. So, you know, before, if I couldn't find a completed listing or, or, uh, you know, a, an end buyer immediately, it's not something I would have bought, um, or paid too much for. And knowing exactly what the market was at that exact time was very helpful. I ended up passing on that, uh, coin, uh, whereas before I might have taken a gamble with it. I might have bought it for, you know, thinking, speculating what I might be able to sell it for. So it's the one-off stuff like that that I've seen flow through this network uh, thousands and thousands of times, just different types of items um, that uh, that are, hard, you know, relatively hard to price. And there's some things that are much harder to price than that. Uh, the other thing we really wanted, I, I think there's plenty of networks out there. Um, some of them are all-inclusive. Some of them are, uh, you know, more exclusive. But what was missing, I believe, is the real-time interaction and the um, and, and, and highly vetted membership. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to connect, you know, the coin shop in rural Tennessee with the major players like Heritage or David Lawrence or some of these guys and connect them together in a way that hasn't been done. And that is something that I think that's one of the real uh, – values that we have brought to the market that nobody else has. In addition, I think that we have built sort of beyond a trading platform, we've, we've built, uh, you know, almost a family. It's sort of like an exclusive um, uh, membership where people are just proud to be a part of it. And we, as long as you're a trusted dealer, doesn't matter how big or small, um, you go through the, through the process and you get in as long as, um, as long as everything checks out and you are you are trusted then you are you are certainly admitted in explain to collectors who don't have firsthand experience in running a, a brick and mortar coin business uh, what it is like uh, one of the realities being that somebody in your position uh, has uh, a finite limit on capitalization and it takes quite a bit of capitalization to carry any kind of inventory um, because not all of it moves quickly not all of it moves at a profit if you stock precious metals, they're not cheap, especially gold or platinum, palladium. Um, most certified coins also are not cheap. Um, even if you have just a few dozen coins that are only a couple hundred dollars each, that's capital uh, that's tied up. Uh, not all of the this material moves quickly. Um, it's uh, even more intense capital when you're talking about thousand dollar coins or, or even bigger coins than that. Uh, and this is why uh, dealers have a choice to make. You know, if they're over-the-counter products they sell tend to not be as valuable, tend to not be as nice. And when they buy, uh, they have to be able to do deals wholesale with one another uh, to find that customer for a coin uh, and move it out as quickly as possible to free up the capital that they put into it. Uh, so the effect that this has, of course, is when people walk through the door with their collections. Uh, let's just say it's a coin collection or a coin collectioner. Uh, rolls of gold coins or what have you, uh, that one, the money you have available to make the transaction on the spot may be limited. And two, when they look at the type of stock you can afford to carry, if they have bigger collections, more valuable collections, they may not look at your operation as a viable place uh, to sell their coins when they're done or to buy new coins, which, it, which again, sort of, you know, hurts you because the very market you're trying to serve uh, uh, is not a market you can serve uh, because the capital requirements in order to uh, meet the needs of the sophisticated collectors may just not be there. Uh, and, and the type of material you're stocking may not be uh, sufficient to compel somebody to want to do long-term business with you. Is this a, a fair and accurate read and how the back end of a, a brick and mortar coin store, you know, really works? Yeah. So I think that I'm, I am, I'm sort of representative of the dealers that, that, um, that are probably 
the beneficiaries of this type of platform. Because before I started the group, I was uh, I started the, the my coin shop in 2006, and I'm a net buying operation. Most of our most of the deals that we do in the shop are buying, so it's it, it's easy to buy uh, items in bulk. When you go to sell them, it's a little more difficult. Um, I have never set up at a show, and I really didn't do the show market uh, shows unless, um, you know, there was one in Atlanta, and i just go, I wouldn't set up, and I wasn't on any of the trading networks. So I think I have a unique perspective in that way. In the, in the On the collector side, um, there's really limited opportunities right now, and I think we're going to try to change that. So a collector right now, he has a few options. Um, he can do some research online. He can try to post it on eBay. But the, at the end of the day, um, the majority bring them to a coin shop. In the coin shop, such as mine, I probably at this time wholesale out 70 or 80% of what I buy. And I think most coin shops are probably that way because we specialize in certain types of coins. We take certain coins we set them aside for retail. And just by default, we can't be the strongest buyers on everything that comes in the door because we are going to, in turn, wholesale those items out. I think what we're working towards and what the what the uh, market wants is more of direct access to either the end user, so peer-to-peer trading, or direct access to the strongest buyers. That, that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants the strongest buyer. So with this network, I think that we are we will be able to to connect collectors to the strongest buyers. Um, for instance, I, I had a uh, an 1843 two and a half, uh, I believe it was in '62. The, the gentleman brought it in a couple years ago, and he wanted twelve thousand five hundred dollars, or it was right in that range. And it wasn't something I was able to buy at the time. I think I offered him maybe ten or eleven. And he just couldn't do it. He came in again a year later, and, and again, we just couldn't get there. Um, the final time he came in was after we started the network. It was probably two or three months into the network. Uh, this gentleman was uh, in South Carolina, and he would shop it around to the different dealers, and he just could not get his number. So he came in, and I had the idea, okay, well, I have this network now, and I'm going to post the coin up and say, you know, who's the strongest buyer on this coin? I just can't close this deal. If you help me close the deal, you can have the coin. And we ended up getting his number. Um, I think the final number was 13000 so I was able to give the, the uh, collector his 12 five that he wanted. So not only did I win, I was able to move a product that I never would have been able to move. He was able to move uh, a coin and get all the money, essentially. And then the, the end... And the buyer was able to buy a coin that he wanted, and, and he probably had a customer for it, and he made his little spread on it. Um, kind of funny thing about that is is the coin that he was shopping around, it ended up going back to that exact same city. So the coin was shipped to me. I bought it, shipped it back to that same city, and uh, everybody won. So that was just kind of a, a strange phenomenon where it ended up, going right back and he probably shopped it to that to, to that same dealer and just couldn't get his number if you look at the trajectory of the brick and mortar coin businesses over the course of the past uh, three decades you know we've seen a real decline in this uh, type of business which has taken place at the same time and maybe coincidentally uh, with the rising cost of classic coins brought about you know in large part due to coin certification and uh, incremental pricing based on grade you know, I, I have to admit that um, I've been to very few coin shops across the country that specialize almost entirely on certified coins, uh, which tells me that it's probably very difficult to have a shop where you stock and sell only $500,000, $5,000 or more dollar certified coins uh, to retail customers uh, and have enough customers to keep the lights on. As it pertains to this kind of material, uh, what is a local shop's likely ability to stock and sell items over the counter? as opposed to buying and immediately flipping wholesale to someone else, say a dealer with a national customer network or an auction house? Yeah, I think that there's a, there's a few dynamics, and everybody's different. Uh, my shop here, we don't have a, a ton of retail numismatic collectors. I think that there's a lot of companies out there that do that are brick-and-mortar shops, and they have nurtured um, 
their customer base and their locate their uh, immediate surrounding areas for for decades. Some of them. So I think that they have better processes in place, and I'm okay with that because I think that we all choose our models, or we we are, you know, kind of funneled into a certain model because of our uh, demographics around our area. Uh, we do have a strong buying operation here at, at the Golden Coin Exchange, and we do see a lot of material coming in. And uh, it takes everything we have just to just to be able to move the product out. As far as percentages on on items, it seems like it's it's a relatively low margin. Um, I think most of us are on numismatics are working on a you know 10 to 15 percent margin at best. Um, Sites like eBay, you know, they take 10 or 12 percent on a lot of this stuff. So we're really being squeezed uh, from all directions as far as overhead costs and fees. Um, it's just it's more and more difficult, especially with the market it's starting to come back, but you know, tending to go down a little bit over the years. Uh, we're all being squeezed. It's hard to hold material for a long period of time and actually turn a profit on it. Um, but it depends on the product. I mean, a lot of this, the bullion type stuff, we're making one or two percent. A lot of the numismatic stuff, we make ten to eleven percent. Um, if it's a if it's a raw coin and we have to make it into a grade and, and then market it, obviously we our margins should be a little bit higher. Um, but that's that's what I think collectors um, probably don't understand it is the tight margins of a brick and mortar store or even some of these larger companies uh, who do a, a lot of advertising. I mean, the, the, some of these companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertising every month. And those margins um, get eaten away by those, uh, by the cost. Um, and then they, they also may be, uh, not have a great idea of what their coin's worth because they might look online and they might see a price online, but they're not factoring in that, that those prices, for one, may not be accurate or they may be representative of a, you know, PQ coin. Um, and, and a lot of coins have issues, uh, high field issues, or maybe they're in the wrong holder. They should be, you know, you know they're overgraded. Um, so there's so many variables that if you're not in the business and you're not, um, you know, you don't eat, sleep, and breathe the business, there's there's so many variables involved in pricing a coin that it becomes very difficult, uh, even for dealers, much less collectors. Isn't there a danger though for a local coin shop and not stocking, let's just call it uh, high grade, big ticket, classic coins, because it seems that you know. What you put over the counter may be what actually sticks in the mind of that potential new collector. Uh, that if the coins aren't really that attractive, impressive, or, or valuable, it may send the wrong message to them that you know coins aren't that interesting, that there's not beauty and value in, in buying coins. Also, if you, if you consider maybe an informed or experienced collector who's looking to sell or their family uh, after they passed on to sell that collection, if they look at the counter and they see, you know, junk boxes of V nickels and 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 sort of, uh, you know, cheaper Morgan dollars and things like that, they, they may come to the conclusion that your business isn't the right place to do business with, and that they're better uh, served consigning their coins to auction or selling them to someone else entirely at a, at a major coin show, which uh, thus severs. Uh, permanently the relationship that a brick and mortar dealer is trying to establish with collectors in his own community. Yes. So if, if and again, I, I think we've taken a few polls in the group and we, we kind of understand that, uh, that what we do have for the most part is that most coin dealers don't retail everything. They, they just can't because the material, material might come in too fast. And that's why wholesale, uh, that's why the wholesale market is so big. And I think that's probably why our group has taken off so much is that, um, that that's most of our models is that, um, that we do wholesale. So I think collectors should understand that. I don't know if it's sending the wrong message. I think it's important for them to know that, um, that every coin is different and every, every coin has a different market. And, um, 
you know, we may have those contacts to move that product, but it's very difficult for a collector to find an end buyer for each one of his coins that he might have. Um, so, you know, if we can move towards a model where we can collect, we can connect collectors to the right people at the right time for the right product, then I think we can net them more money and we can create, which I think is important. I think that the collectors and the inheritors of, of this, of, of these items should get all the money. So I, I think that we are moving towards, like I said, a, a peer to peer trading market because people want to sell to the end user. Uh, they understand that they can't get all the money from the dealers and, um, but that's not to say that we can't. So, and we can't start moving towards a model where we can get the collectors all the money for the, uh, for their item. Um, so if somebody brings in a collection to me and I can take those products and move them to the right people in real time, then we can maximize, uh, the money coming into the collector. And I think that's, I, I, I don't think there's any um, coin shops out there that run with that model where they can move your product to the right people because we're all just, we're all just buying the stuff. We know, we kind of know where we're going to go with it, but if we can move it um, directly to the right people at the right time, I think we can net more money for the collectors. And I'm okay with that. I, I, I would rather move more product and make less margin than, um, than, uh, you know, not getting the collectors what they deserve to get, which is. Do you have any estimates as to, you know, what the size of the brick and mortar coin market is? I mean, how many shops are we seeing in 2018 that do profits, you know, in a high six figures or low seven figures on an annual basis, you know, dealers with storefronts, you know, that would be, you know, the ideal dealer uh, to be part of your uh, community. So my whole goal, I think, I think this is my goal personally with the roundtable and with the coin dealers helping coin dealers is, is connect. I think that's the key word is connect, create a pipeline, like you said earlier. If, and, and we've done that to a large extent. Um, there's certainly a need to encourage young collectors, uh, bring young collectors into the market. And I think that's being done, and I think there's plenty of people doing that. My my goal, and, and probably what what I will commit my career to, is making dealers, is, is getting dealers the connections that they need to be successful. And I, I, because in my mind, I'm a coin dealer in in Marietta, Georgia. I create collectors, you know, I create collectors all the time by by showing them coins, by creating a passion, by directing them towards, towards uh, a certain type of coin, and just getting them excited about coin collecting. Um, and I'm one coin dealer. So if, if we can sort of work together in the industry and, and give collectors, uh, dealers, I should say, the tools that they need to be successful, I think that's a game changer. And I think that there's a lot of people like the deal I said earlier about I was able to finally close that deal. That that was an eye-opener for me, and it told me that if we can do that more with younger collectors, uh, younger dealers, then we really could change the market. Um, as far as the mark, you know, the, the growth that the average coin dealers do, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, working on 10 or 20% margins, I mean, you almost have to do seven figures. In, unless you are uh, a vest pocket guy that has, actually has a full-time job. I mean, you almost have to do seven figures to keep the lights on. Um, so, but I don't know what the average is. I, I know about what we do. And I don't know what the average brick-and-mortar coin shop does. I would imagine it would be in the seven figures uh, at least. Do you think we're going to see a continuance of the uh, long-term decline of brick-and-mortar coin shops? Uh or does there exist uh, some condition where we might see a new wave of shops open up around the country? I mean, we did get a, a temporary boost during the first term of the Obama administration when we saw a big run-up on gold uh, and an extraction, really, of, of gold from people uh, by cash for gold shops. 
Uh, and it seems like that has mostly gone away after gold peaked and most of those shops are gone now. But do you think we might see a return of uh, the brick and mortar business? I do actually. I mean, I think we're on a downward trend, but I, I think that I am excited about what's coming. I think that, that there, there is a re-energization in the market um, on the dealer side. And I, you know, I just want to contribute to that and, and uh, help. So I think that, I think that we will see, I don't, I think that we'll see more um, brick and mortar shops uh, if we can give the, those uh, dealers the connections that they need. Um, so I, I do see a re-energization uh, coming um, because, but I also think that there's a there's a pretty good gap. I think that it you know there it is a it, it's an older generation's hobby. Uh, but what I see online on Facebook and some of these groups and Instagram and other social media platforms is that behind me, I'm, I'm late 30. Um, I think that the majority of our uh, uh, industry is probably, you know, well above 50, above 60 for the most part. In my group alone, um, our demographics are uh, probably 22% of our members, and I do have the insights, but it's right around 22% of our members are under 30. Um, but then also about 22% of our members are between 30 and 50. So even though they're about the same, I still think that there's a gap between the generation ahead of me and the generation behind me. And what we've done is we've connected them in a way that, that they really needed. And I think that it benefits um, some of the more established companies because they're seeing more material flow their way. And we're, we're also giving – the younger generation opportunities that they would never have had by connecting them with those dealers. So what we're trying to do is create a bridge, merge the gap, and I think we're successful. I think we've I think we've really done that. I think we've built a foundation that um, that's just going to keep snowballing and, and really can't be stopped. I think that the energy we have is is unlike anything else out there. Um, because we've created more than a trading platform, I want to make that clear. That we have we have built sort of an association and a, a channel for sharing information, and people are just more than willing to share what they know on this platform. If somebody posts a coin up, I don't know what this is. You'll have five guys that jump in and say, "Hey, this is what this coin is," and I think we've created that. Um, that feeling of, of helping it's in the name coin dealers helping coin dealers that's our motto and that's that's what we want to i think that's the core of what we've done because at the end of the day i mean seriously we we all we're all here because partially because we love it but we all need to make money and the only way to make money is to know what you're dealing with and know where the market is so, and we we have I just can't thank the members enough because they really created that culture and, and they're continuing to create that culture. And we add new members every day. And um, I think we have a long way to go, but I think the foundation we've built is rock solid for sure. And I don't think, I don't think there's anything else like it out there. In what ways uh, was the existing dealer to dealer wholesale trading apparatus insufficient and in filling the need that your group sought to cater to? You know, the, the idea of a dealer-to-dealer -dealer sales channel is not exactly a new concept for the rare coin market. Uh, but there must have been a missing component in your view. Was it uh, technology? Uh, were existing groups too closed off to smaller shops and newer businesses? I mean, what was the problem? Um, I, I, I think that they all have different models. I think that, um, you know, there's, there's some that are super exclusive and um, – you know, harder to get into, but then I think there's some that are almost too inclusive. They, you know, I think that what we've done is, is created a truly inclusive dealer network. And there, some, some are all inclusive of dealers and collectors, and some are super exclusive to, to just, um, you know, really, uh, you know, well connected dealers, I guess I would say. And I think that we're just kind of filling the gap. I, I think that the ones that are out there right now are, are doing exactly what they need to do. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong, um, but I think that we've we've just created a new 
um, a new idea with with the round table. And the round table is is sort of the the association that we built. It's a round table. If you're a round table dealer, that means you've been vetted, you're trusted, you're honest, and um, we are uh, trying to include as many as we can to just keep the younger generation engaged. And I, I think there's real opportunities ahead of us. How will collectors know that their local dealer is a member of your group? It seems that uh, you know it would benefit uh, them to know that uh, their local dealer has a 24-7 trading network and the ability to make immediate offers on and move product when it comes through the door. You know, uh, you, you, as, a, as, a, as a seller, I think I would expect to get more from a dealer who had the ability to immediately sell my product as opposed to, you know, somebody who's just going to speculate on whether they can move, you know, a, a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand dollar coin at some point in the future. Does your group have any plans in providing network dealers a signage, storefront signage to inform the public of their association with the group? Yeah, so what we have is uh, what's called a roundtable authorized dealer. And the, and the roundtable is the company that I formed to, uh, you know, kind of form. That's the entity that we formed that coin dealers helping coin dealers falls under. And we do have roundtable authorized dealers. We have a few hundred of them already. And every one of them I trust. I mean, I, w- I would send a collector to them, any of, any of these guys, anytime. Um, and know that they're going to be treated right. Uh, so we don't have um, – we're in the early stages of that. So we're, we've been doing the coin dealers helping coin dealers for about 16 months, and I think we're making pretty good progress, and our pace is good, and our, our momentum is excellent. And um, I think that in the future, a roundtable authorized dealer is going to be uh, the go-to organization to know that you're getting a fair shake in the market. And what we're going to do is make sure that all of the roundtable authorized dealers treat everybody with integrity and respect and, and uh, you know, with honest, and we take care of the collector because that's what it's all about. We need to make sure our industry has integrity, and uh, I think for the most part we do. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that collectors know that that the majority of us are good, the majority of us are honest, and we, just like any industry, we just can't let a few uh, a few bad eggs uh, paint, a, paint a broad brush on the rest of us. Because there are people out there to be concerned about. Um, you know, we get these, we get um, receipts that come in and, and coins that come in where people just paid way too much for them. And my concern is that not only did that person get hurt, but we lose two or three generations of would-be collectors. If granddad got burned on some coins and they bring it in here and I have to tell them the truth about it, um, we lose them. I mean, they may have been collectors, but, but uh, you know, they saw their granddad get burned and they just don't want any part of it. Uh, so I think that we as an industry need to fight that sort of operation that does that. And we can't be the police of it. We can't tell people how to price their items, but we can at least get in front of it and, and tell them that uh, that we are here to educate them and to show them. I think education is the key tool. No, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, most dealers uh, are not in the business to uh, hurt customers or rip them off. Uh, when you consider how hard it is to maintain the business to begin with, uh, it becomes even harder when you alienate uh, your customers and make them not want to come back. Uh, you know, the industry's had many headwinds affecting, uh, you know, uh, the way the rare coin market operates. Um, these are cultural headwinds, the way we view money, technological headwinds, the uh, ability people have of uh, occupying their time with other expensive hobbies. Um, also, we're an industry that, you know, by its very structure is rooted in history and the appreciation of historical objects. Uh, and that itself is antithetical uh, to a modern future-focused world. The majority of our uh, rare coin markets marketing concepts, I think, though, are rooted in a revolution that happened uh, over 30 years ago. And you know, although I think that's still vital, uh, it seems that we are at a point now where we need to determine for ourselves new paths forward um, to grow the hobby, uh, to be profitable, uh, to grow the industry. 
uh, and uh, to entice people to get involved with rare coins. Uh, there's nothing like holding a coin in your hand and imagining a time and place long before your own, holding that piece of history and admiring its art and significance. Uh, and, and that comes from a personal connection, I think, that people have with the item that you can't get off the internet alone. Like the internet will show you a great picture of something, but until you actually get it in your hand, you can't experience it. And I think that by not having enough opportunities to experience in person, we limit our choice. And so uh, this in turn has an effect on the market and, and how we relate to coins. Um, I remember spending hundreds of hours at coin shops as a, as a, as a kid uh, and uh, enjoying looking at everything, touching everything, seeing things that I would never buy, wanting things I never thought I would. Uh, being empowered to collect whatever it was that struck my interest at the moment. Uh, something that I think I couldn't do exactly the same way, completely relying on buying at the internet or waiting every two or three months for a show to come around my area. So I hope uh, that you know your uh, marketplace uh, thrives and grows. I know coin dealers I've talked to have been very excited about it. I hope it propels a new phase of the market where we see more shops and more people looking for those magical coins that spark a lifetime of collecting. So good luck with your group, and uh, I hope you join us again soon. Thank you. Yeah, it is, it, it's, just, it's just been so much fun, and coin collecting and, and dealing is so much fun. Um, it really is fun. I mean, I consider myself somebody that, that, is, that just really enjoys what I'm doing. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. And remember, you can download all, almost 100 episodes of the Coin Week podcast for free from the iTunes store. Makes a good drive time listen if you're into numismatics. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.